Welcome to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today we're talking with Grover Cleveland, the author of the best-selling career advice book for new lawyers, Swimming Lessons for Baby Sharks, The Essential Guide to Thriving as a New Lawyer. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess, that's me. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the Catapult Conference. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today we're talking to Grover Cleveland, a Seattle lawyer, speaker, and the author of the best-selling career advice book for new lawyers, Swimming Lessons for Baby Sharks, The Essential Guide to Thriving as a New Lawyer. Welcome, Grover. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thanks, Lee. Glad to be here. So to get things kicked off, can you share a bit more about yourself and what got you interested in writing this book, which I think has one of my favorite titles? We'll talk about the title (laughs) in a minute, but I remember the first time I heard about this book, I thought it was pretty funny. Sure. I'm a lawyer in Seattle, and I started my career in private practice uh, here in the Northwest at Foster Pepper, which is one of the larger law firms in Seattle. And I was a summer associate, an associate, and uh, then a partner at Foster Pepper. And writing a book was always on my life list. I ended up writing this book because I found my own transition to practice was quite abrupt. I felt like I just sort of had to start and felt lost. And as I advanced in my career, I saw you know, other junior lawyers uh, feeling the same way and making some of the same mistakes. And I didn't like to see them struggle. So I, I started taking notes very early on, and then I continued to work on it and put it together. Um, and then the first edition came out in 2010, and the second edition came out just a couple months ago. And since it's uh, since the book's publication, I've been doing programs on career success at law schools and law firms so that new lawyers can hit the ground running and understand how to practice and gain the skills that they didn't get in law school. Yeah, I think that's really important work. And now, did you go straight from undergrad to law school to working in a firm or did you take a break? I um, worked, um, uh, I had about a three-year break. I worked a year and a half as a reporter and then another year and a half uh, doing corporate public relations before I went to law school. Oh, interesting. Gio, I did public relations for a bit between undergrad and law school as well. Learned a lot. That's right, <laughs> yes. Um, because I think that that is one thing that can be important, I think, when students are considering this transition is I think if you have worked in in a corporate environment or in a business environment, sometimes you have learned some of these lessons of, of work life. <laughs> but a lot of law students go straight through. And I think that transition can even be harder. Yes, particularly when you're trying to learn those sort of professionalism norms. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the same time, you're trying to learn the substantive law, it can be a very steep curve. Yeah. Yeah, that's very sure. Okay, so now to one of my my favorite points is where did the title come from? Because I love this title. <laughs> well, I was um, working on the book in Costa Rica. I had decided that I needed a big chunk of time uh, to get a lot of my notes organized and do a lot of writing. And so I had picked out a place in Costa Rica that was perfect. And I had just arrived and had gotten um, out on this uh, terrace overlooking the ocean at my hotel. This sounds awful, by the way. I just was, don't know how yes, you suffered through yes, it. This sounds yes, terrible. Yes, I guess notes uh, to everyone, if you want to write a book, take Grover's yes, plan and go to Costa Rica. <laughs> it, it helps with productivity dramatically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I had I'd only been there about a half an hour. I'm, I have my laptop out. And this other guest just walked by and said, oh, you shouldn't be working on your vacation. And I said, well, I'm not actually working. I'm writing a book. And he said, what's it about? And I said, it's a career advice book for new lawyers. 
And he said, well, what are you going to call it? Swimming lessons for baby sharks? <laughs> and my jaw <laughs> dropped. And That's hilarious. When I recovered uh, my sanity, I said, yes, I am now. <laughs> and it's way better than my working title, which was sink or swim. So. Oh, well, but so you had the you had the the water element in there. Yes. Yes. You know, <laughs> that's yes. a that's a fantastic story and a fantastic idea to go to Costa Rica to work. You know, I actually wrote a blog post on the Bar Exam Toolbox a couple of years ago about people who move to crazy locations or beautiful locations to study for the bar. Now that so much of bar prep is done online and that a lot of people to save money were like going to Thailand to study for the bar for two months because it's so cheap to live in Thailand compared to, you know, living in, say, the Bay Area. Um and then you get to study and live on the beach, which isn't such a bad idea, really, when you think that, about it. That sounds brilliant. <laughs> I know, right? I was like, why didn't I think of that back when I was sitting for the bar? Oh. So over the years, I mean, you had um, you know this a very long career with one firm, which is actually not necessarily as common as it used to be, um, because you know folks oftentimes move around a lot. So you've had a chance to, you know not only be a new lawyer in a law firm, but manage young lawyers and really watch them throughout their careers. And that in that first step for a lot of those new lawyers is to become a summer associate, which I did and, and most people who have firm careers, I think, do. So, you know, for our listeners who are maybe starting out on the summer associate path, uh, what are some of the common missteps that summer associates make when they join a firm? Well, I think because of the casual fun atmosphere, which is intentional, it can be easy to forget that it's an eight week, inter eight or 10 week interview, mm -hmm. and everyone's paying attention to what you're doing. And even at the very informal social events, people will remember, you know, how did you interact with others? They're trying to get a sense of how you will get along with them, how you will get along with their clients. So people need to maintain their professionalism and their filter, even though uh, there can be some very fun events. And, and alcohol involved. Yes. And yeah. I recommend that uh, people, uh, you know, have one or maybe two drinks, uh, but don't go crazy uh, just because there's free booze. That's it's one of the easiest ways to you know, have a, a meltdown. Yeah, you don't want to be remembered for the person who's dancing on the table because they have right. too many Mai Tais at the, the tiki bar. Right. Um, right. And I think one of the things that's hard about that too is sometimes the lawyers that work at the firm, sometimes they might be drinking inappropriately, but that is not a license for you as a summer associate to drink inappropriately at a business event. That's right, because they already have full-time jobs, right. <laughs> and some of them may be partners, they may be owners, and um, it still might impact their careers, so yeah. it's, it's not the greatest idea. Yeah, I think that's really true. Okay, what else? There have got to be other things that, that happen, too. Uh, one other thing uh, that's easy to do is to take on too much work, and, you know, summer associates are eager, and they want to meet lots of people, but they don't have a sense of how long things will take. Mm -hmm. And um, people are going to be expecting to see your best work. So they're going to decide whatever you turn in is the best that you can do. And it, that's what it needs to be. So you don't want to cut corners and you don't want to get to the end of the summer and have projects uh, that aren't done. So um, it's better, particularly as a summer associate, uh, to just make sure that you can handle uh, the workload that you're you're setting for yourself. Mm -hmm. I no one's no one's going to be you know looking at your revenue, <laughs> right? And actually, most of the time, they can't even bill out your work, right? right. So the, the I mean, the firm's kind of like eating the cost right. of having you right. there, um, which is important to remember too. Um, you're not the same as people who've passed the bar and are being billed as associates. Right, right. Yeah. Well, and along those lines, another thing is that sometimes people get carried away with the perks because you know, there are lots of social events and then people start asking for this or that um, because they've heard 
some of it and another firm gets it and my recommendation on that is to let the firm lead on the perks because mm -hmm. you know as you recognize firms are businesses uh summer associate programs are expensive and there are budgets and a firm might uh acquiesce to a request that it really doesn't want to right. so just um if you can show that you understand the firm as a business that's very helpful yeah you know, something else that I think people often forget is you're not just getting feedback from the lawyers at the firm or your direct supervisors. It's also very important to be conscious of your interactions with support staff and paralegals and folks that work in the firm because they will also talk to you about <laughs> or talk about you to um, folks if they have a negative interaction um, because they work for the people who are making those hiring decisions. And, um, and I think that they're thoughts have a lot of weight oftentimes. And so you really do want to just be conscious that you're entering this environment in a temporary way, but you want to make sure that the folks that you interact with have a positive experience with you. Um, and so being sure you're being friendly and open and respectful to everyone, no matter what their role in the firm, because let's be honest, a lot of those paralegals know way more about practicing law than you do as a similar associate. That's an excellent point. And I think it's more common than not for firms to send out uh, requests for feedback to every single person in the firm mm -hmm. uh, on summer associates. So paralegals, secretaries, um, you know, I have a friend who says, you know, be nice to the janitor. And I <laughs> yeah. think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think that is really overlooked. Um, and I even remember um, a um, a legal secretary for one of the or assistant for one of the partners at the firm um, commented on the fact that um, she thought I dressed appropriately for the office um, and that she found it very nice that a summer associate dressed appropriately for the office. And I found this to be kind of a funny thing, but I also um, respect that, you know, times are changing and a lot. And of course, I was in the Bay Area, so um Law firms are not as formal as they are in other communities, but, you know, you also don't want to be noticed for not dressing appropriately um, at the office because you don't want to stand out in that way either. And she said she stopped me at the elevator and told me, and I mean, I'm no like fashion plate, let's be honest. I had just like gone to Nordstrom and like bought some nice clothes for the summer because the rest of my clothes were kind of like fleeces and sweatshirts and, and jeans. But it was just the idea that I had also worked in a professional environment. So I like, I went to Nordstrom and talked to one of the sales ladies and said, I have this job. I need, you know, a little mini wardrobe for the summer and she just helped me get appropriate clothes. And, and I do think that that's part of it is they want to see you in that role and see that you're taking it seriously. Right. That's, that's very true. And, you know, one thing I emphasize is you want people to focus on your brain. So you don't want your clothes to be a distraction, right. but you want them to um, help you look professional, look credible, so um, it can communicate that you understand what you're doing, that you're smart, and uh, that you're credible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's something to think about. You know, again, I think it's like, I like that you say you're not, you don't want them necessarily to speak for you, but you don't want to be noticed because you're in like distressed jeans, maybe, or right. not the best right. options on casual Friday. <laughs> right. And take right. cues from the people you work for. Um, you know, I think to, if you're not sure what casual Friday means in your office, maybe be less casual on your first casual Friday so you can make sure you're not too casual until you figure out what everyone else is doing. Right. And, and people have different norms and you just don't know if some very uh, conservative lawyer at the firm will uh, have a problem with someone being too casual. I I heard a comment at a conference about a uh, senior partner complaining that a new uh, summer associate didn't wear a tie on the first day. Mm -hmm. And this partner still remembered that. So wow. it's better to err on the side of being more formal than less formal, at least until you land that job. Yeah. And another thing is, depending on your summer associate um, experience, if you are at a firm where they don't, you don't have to dress up every day. Um, 
you may want to consider keeping a suit or a jacket or something in your um, office or in your cubicle. So you could change if somebody were to invite you to something um, last minute, invite you to court, invite you to meet with a client, you need to be able to um, show up and look like, you know, a, a lawyer, even if you're not one yet, <laughs> if possible. Yes. You know, and that's, that's like, the, like such an old trick. But my, my dad was a prosecutor and every prosecutor had a second suit, you know, like hanging in their office. Um, one, in case something happened to the suit they were wearing, but also on casual Fridays, like what were they going to do if they got called into court? They couldn't show up in like a rugby shirt. <laughs> but that's right. And, you know, as you uh, alluded to, people do spill coffee and things like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my dad has a great story of, and I'm sure, I hope he's not listening to this podcast because he might think this is not maybe the best story to share. But um, I think he was in trial and they went out to like an Italian food lunch and and it was a meatball sauce tie shirt situation <laughs> that happened at lunch. And I think he, at uh. that point he didn't have another full, um, you know, like shirt and tie. And it was like the sprint to the mall <laughs> where it was like buy the shirt and tie, like like see if they could press it enough <laughs> so it could go under a suit jacket to make it back in court in time. Unnecessary right. drama if it can be avoided. Yes. So, um, <laughs> yes. And and as my dad's practice changed, uh, then he would keep one in his car just so he always had a second suit in his car because you never right. knew. Right. Um, so, um, okay. So you survive your summer associate experience. Um, you you get the job offer. You're excited because you it's got zeros behind it you may have never seen. And then um, you get this job. And then, of course, there are some pitfalls that can happen when you're a new lawyer at the firm. So what you know? What do you think that that's some of the things that new lawyers really need to worry about, even once they've gotten the job? Well, time management is a challenge, even for senior lawyers. Yeah. And for new lawyers, it's probably the first time they've uh, gotten numerous projects from different bosses, uh, many of which, you know, maybe have short deadlines. And it's very difficult at first to understand and figure out how long uh, projects are going to take. Even the signing lawyers aren't sure because they right. don't know, how, you know, what the answer is. Uh, they may have an estimate, but uh, time management is a huge challenge, and no one intends to miss deadlines, but it happens, and it causes problems. Um, so that's something I really encourage new lawyers to focus on. You know, what I'd add to that is something that I think a lot of new lawyers don't think about, too, is um, being conscious, if you are in a billing situation, being conscious of time management when it comes to research and writing, especially, because this might be the first time that Westlaw and Lexis, you actually may get be charging someone based on like every search you're doing. <laughs> and, um, and sometimes you can't do four hours of Westlaw research for an assignment that really shouldn't take four hours of research. Um, and that might make that one you know, motion in limine, a very, very expensive motion in limine, and it might anger a few different people. So I think that's really another thing to try and check in about with folks about, you know, what tools can you use? Um, you know, are there tools that, that you should be conscious of with cost? Because different and different clients have different cost thresholds of what they worry about. Oh, absolutely. And I, I when you get the assignment, in addition to making sure you understand the assignment, so you don't go down a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. It's very important to get an estimate of how much time the senior lawyer thinks it should take because mm -hmm. that is a ballpark um, figure of how much the senior lawyer thinks the client's willing to pay. Mm -hmm. And if you get halfway down the road and you don't have an answer, you can't stop, but you do need to check in and say, this is where I am, this is what I've gotten. What should I do now? You've got to get guidance. You can't just spin your wheels. That's what keeps senior lawyers up at night. They're thinking that you're burning through all this time. They're going to have to write it off and um, you won't have the answer. Yeah, I think that's true. I have a question for you. I've recently been to a few things where people are taking notes on their cell phones instead of mm -hmm. on paper. I feel like if you're in a law firm situation, if if somebody gets called, if you get called into somebody's office, you should still have a notepad and paper 
I feel like a lot of partners wouldn't want to watch you type on your phone. Do you think that's true? Uh, it depends. You know, I, if, if you're in uh, Silicon Valley and it's a young partner, uh, you know, that's probably fine. Uh, what I hear a lot is people uh, come in to get an assignment and they don't have anything <laughs> to take notes with. So uh, probably a pen and paper is uh, easiest. So you don't have the um, stereotype of, um, so it doesn't look like you're texting or doing something yeah, else. I know. Um, but you have to have something to take notes so you under so you can actually write down the assignment because it's um, it's frustrating for a lawyer to give an assignment for the person who got the assignment to go away and then come back and sort of ask what was it really what was I supposed to do um, you. You kind of get one shot yeah. uh, at to get the assignment. So yes, bring a pen. <laughs> Do you know? I remember one of my um, one of my assignments. I was actually brought on to a trial team, which is very exciting. And I get pulled into um, the, a senior associate's office, and you know, and he goes, uh, you know, I. It was about welding. It was a toxic tort case about about welding and fumes and things like that. And so he asked if I knew something about welding rods. And I made some sort of like comments, like of some funny joke about what I thought a welding rod was. And then I looked at him and I was thinking, oh, he doesn't think that's funny. Like this is not funny for him. <laughs> and it was just a good reminder that like, yeah, some of this stuff, not funny. Like this is serious right. business, you know, like this yes. is a trial team. And it was just a good reminder. I mean, he didn't really care. It was just a private yes. meeting between the two of us. But it was also just a good reminder of this is serious business. He's not really, you know, I'm not in his office to like joke around about this case. He just wants me to get me up to speed so I can like take assignments from him and make his life easier. That's right. Yes. Law firms are a lot like emergency rooms. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> exactly. Um, anything else um, that new lawyers should stay away from? Oh, I think communications can be a challenge. Uh, like you said, you don't want to be too flip. A, a lot of times people don't understand uh, how they should relate to more senior lawyers. Again, I think you want to uh, treat them uh, with some deference and respect, uh, even though you're colleagues, you're not peers. Uh, so that's important. And I, another thing that's related to what you said, attention to detail is really important and probably uh, something you need to uh, focus on more than you've had to with any other job in your life because yeah. the stakes are high. And I hear over and over again that you know, senior lawyers don't want to um, feel like they're your proofreader or yeah. something. Because if they find small mistakes, then they're like, oh, my God, what else is there? And and that erodes trust. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. And I actually remember <clears throat> getting that feedback from a senior associate um a different one, <laughs> same trial team, different senior associate. But I, one of my jobs on that trial team was actually I just wrote all of the low hanging fruit of the emotions in lemonade because that they just had to crank mm -hmm. through. And he, his compliment to me was that when he got my work, he, he, you know, he just read it, approved it, and was able to move on. And that he didn't feel like you know there weren't citation glaring citation errors there weren't glaring typos and that he didn't waste his time because i think you're right i mean a lot of this just comes down to time they don't want to spend their they're billing out at incredibly high rates they're not getting paid that level to like fix typos or clean up your citations that's right i you know i uh i remind new lawyers that senior lawyers aren't there to fix your work they don't want to fix your work they want to check it and conclude that you got the right answer, uh, but they'd like to send it out as is, if possible. Yep. So as little time as they can spend on it and satisfy themselves that it's accurate and gets the job done, that's your goal. Yeah. And I think linked to this is something that Allison and I also talk about a lot, which are the importance of soft skills um, for New lawyers, especially, um, especially as the legal market changes, um, what do you think are some of the skills that that are non legal skills that law students need to think about having when they enter the workforce? 
Well, communication is big, and it, you know it's even broader than verbal communication. I, uh, I hear a lot about you know, presence and poise, and people want to make sure that you present yourself in a way that will put clients at ease. And at, at large firms, you don't have a lot of client interactions early on, uh, at least not with internal clients, but people are trying to cultivate you so that you know you will be able to engender that trust in uh, external clients. So you need to do that internally first. And uh, again, just as with you know, as we talked about with the summer associates, people uh, make conclusions based on everything you say and do, and even things like you know, is your office messy? Because they may decide if your office is messy that you you know are not organized with your thoughts, and that may or may not be accurate. It's true. I have a very messy people office. Need be, people need to be best. conscious of, but you're you're not that way. But. People, <laughs> Well, they they're might have fair, made judgments about me. Very organized. Office. That's right. They may have made <laughs> unfair judgments about you, and so you—that's something. Yeah, you know, um, if you can help it, you don't want to have happen. So yeah, that's how my uh, that's how my um, my assistant knew I was quitting. Is she caught me cleaning my office? Yeah. <laughs> and she said, "Why are you cleaning your office?" And I was like, "Oh." it's just summertime I just finished a big project it's just a good time and then when I gave notice a week later she's like I knew it I knew you were quitting you've never cleaned your office right. <laughs> so yeah keep a clean office then you don't have so many tells that's right that's yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah yeah and it's it's important uh just to get in the habit of thinking about the impression that you're making with everything you say or do, you know, before you open your mouth, is this the right way to say it? What's my goal in saying it? You know, just take a momentary pause and, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's more your filter. It's not an awkward pause, but you have to be strategic about everything you're doing. Yep. Agreed. So for law students considering a career in a firm, um, you know, a lot of people, I think, talk a lot about the realities of law firm life, um, especially when it comes to work-life balance, uh, women especially, but I think all humans should talk about work-life balance. Um, what do you think young lawyers can do to really learn about the realities of work-life balance for a given firm? Because different firms have different reputations and different norms, um, or even set their own comfortable boundaries for what they are willing to do and what they're willing to sacrifice. Yeah, I mean that. This is a tough question, I, and I, my sense is that you know, even though if, if you're looking at firms sort of in the same tier, that the experience for new lawyers is fairly similar because the economics are similar and uh, client needs are similar. Uh, if you're working at a large law firm, projects are usually very high stakes and uh, often urgent. And one of the realities is, is that, you know, market share uh, uh, demand is fairly flat. So uh, there's a lot of competition and um, concern about getting things uh, for the clients, you know, as quickly and accurately as possible. So that um, impacts work-life balance. Um, you know, for the first couple years, working at a firm is a huge learning experience, and I encourage people, to the extent they can, to try to take advantage of those those learning opportunities because, frankly, that will help you throughout your entire career. And uh, I did a poll with Above the Law and Miss JD. And we ask the question, you know, do you agree or disagree? The more you work, the more you learn. And 77% said yes. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so, you know, and, and once you've learned these skills, um, we, in the same poll we asked, you know, did law school prepare you to practice law? 72% said no, law school <laughs> did not prepare them Whoops. to practice. <laughs> so, 
you know, in this, you know, in the early period, you're learning a tremendous amount that will set the foundation for your entire career. So I think it's worth it to make some sacrifices uh, with respect to your personal life. And then once you've gained skills and built relationships and, uh, you know, hopefully become indispensable, then you can set boundaries because you can provide value and people will want you to do their work. So mm-hmm. you can um, put more um, boundaries to some extent around your work. Yeah. And, and take the kinds of work that you'd like. Yeah. So when you're doing interviews with with associates, you know, before they become summer associates, and you're trying to figure out what the work-life balance relationship is for a lot of people, I think you can ask questions softly to get more information. So one of my favorite is, what does your day in the life look like? Yes. You know, so you can just say, like, somebody's like, oh, I have to come in at six, and I'm here till eight, and I always eat dinner at the office, and I, you know, I'm never home to put my kid down, or whatever it might be, then you're going to get a lot of information <laughs> that way without saying, what is your philosophy on work-life balance, you know? And if yes. you're a woman, and you're, and you're worried about, you know, um, you know, flexibility around childcare, you can try and find women to talk to, you know, who may be working part time, um, or may, you know, or people oftentimes, it'll just come up that they might have small children. And then again, you can just say things like, Oh, how do you balance that? Because it is interesting to hear different people talk about different models that are acceptable in the firm. Um, So I think that's kind of a way that you can um, kind of go through and, and get more information. So you can see if that sounds like a good fit for you. I think one of the questions to ask yourself when you're thinking about work-life balance is listen to those stories and say, do I want that to be my life? And if you say yes, you're good to go. (laughs) If you say no, that tells you something. Yes. Although, you know, I do caution people not to ask direct questions about work-life balance because a lot of interviewers will interpret that as, oh, this person doesn't want to work and you'll never get the chance to find out whether the place gets has good work-life balance. Yeah. That's why and, I think the day in the life question is kind of a safe one. Um yes. because you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna find out. <laughs> you know, you're gonna hear. The other issue is at large firms, people can have very different experiences depending on, you know, the kind of work they do, the people they work for. So it's not necessarily the case that if one person has a horrible life that everyone has in the firm has the same life. And, and you know, things vary from uh, week to week. And you could get someone on a bad week if they're, you know, in trial and mm-hmm. then you know, the next week uh, they're off in Hawaii or something. So, And I think that's one of the nice things about the summer associate experience from that perspective is that um, you get eight weeks to talk to people and meet people right. and, um, you know, and have a lot of informal lunches and coffee dates um, to kind of gather information without having to ask some of these direct questions. Um, and that way you can see if, yeah, it's just somebody's having a crummy day and is on a trial team and is miserable or doesn't like their direct supervisor or if it's a more of a firm culture. Because different exactly. firms have different cultures. Right. Exactly. And, you know, it, where's the best place for you, mm-hmm. um, you know, in terms of um, relationships? Yeah. So something else that I think is really important for um, summer associates and young lawyers to think about is feedback. So Allison and I talk a lot about having a growth mindset. We love Carol Dweck's book um, about mindset, but it can be tough to get um, feedback in the firm environment because sometimes, you know, lawyers are not the softest folks. Sometimes the feedback can come off a little harsh or brutal. Um, And how should folks... Um, you know, deal with that? Well, it shouldn't be harsh. It should be respectful. And, you know, if if it's just venting, then that's uh, a different subject and, and that should be dealt with in a different way. But mm-hmm. um, the hope is that it would be constructive and almost all the time it is constructive if you're getting feedback, even if it's very negative, because the easiest thing for a lawyer to do is just not to give you feedback. Right. Uh, It takes valuable time uh, even to give negative feedback. And if uh, they didn't want you uh, 
uh, to learn from it and give you a learning opportunity, uh, you would just hear nothing. And that's one reason you should never assume that no news is good news. But if you can try to glean from the feedback, you know, specific things that you can do differently and, you know, make sure you don't personalize it because it is not about you. It is about the fact that the product you came back with was different from what the assigning lawyer would have done. And that's necessarily going to be the case because the assigning lawyer has worked a lot more than you do. And the assigning lawyer knows that you don't know very much. So it's not a horrible thing uh, not to know. You're expected not to know, but you're also expected to make sure that you incorporate uh, the feedback and, and use it to learn. Mm -hmm. And And if you can... You know, if you can gracefully uh, accept negative feedback, people will respect you. Uh, you know, it, it can be um, even more of a problem if people get defensive or, you know, have a, have a meltdown because it, law, law firms are stressful places and people are expected to, you know, keep calm and carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I think that's very true. And, um, and remember that you know, while this work may be very personal to you, if you have um, a supervising attorney that is just cranking through, you know, reviewing motions or reviewing work for a lot of different people, their feedback may not be very personal. So I think it's it taking it at what it is and not trying to, you know, and, and, and using that growth mindset and saying, wow, this is some feedback, but it's going to make me better. What can I learn from it? Um, instead of saying, I'm stupid and I should never become a lawyer and they're going to fire me, which is not a productive way to think about it. No, because, and, and that's not true because you've already, um, you know, gone through law school, done well, uh, you know, gone through a rigorous hiring process and done well, you can do this. And, you know, that is one thing I really encourage people don't get in your own way. Yeah. Um, just keep plugging away and be persistent and you'll get you know, you'll get points just for that because uh being a resilient is a huge part of being a lawyer i think that's a really really good point and on that point we unfortunately out of time although i have so much fun talking to you you'll have to come back and do another episode with us <laughs> at a I later date i'd love to do okay. that it's been fantastic excellent well if you have any questions or comments please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at Lee at LawSchoolToolbox.com or Allison at LawSchoolToolbox.com or you can always contact us via our website contact form at LawSchoolToolbox.com. If you'd like to check out Grover's book, we will um, have links to that in the show notes, but you can also check out his website, which is www.SwimmingLessonsForBabySharks.com. And thanks for listening. Good luck with your summer associate and new firm jobs, and we'll talk soon. Thank you.